Texas Lutheran University. I'm Dr. Grove. For those of you that don't, don't know me, I'm kind of in charge of the seminar series this semester. Today I'm excited to welcome Dr. Vic Convertino. He got his bachelor's degree in mathematics and physical education at the California State University at San Jose. He got a master's degree in exercise science and a PhD in physiology at the University of California at Davis. Um, he has worked for NASA, for Stanford, for the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, and is currently the senior scientist for combat casualty care at the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research. So let's welcome Dr. Convertino. Thank you. So uh, this is a return for me to what uh, the first time I was here. It was not TLU, but it was TLC, Texas Lutheran College, uh, back in 1990 uh, when Dr. Squires um, uh, hosted me to talk as one of the speakers to the um, region, uh, Texas Regional uh, Chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine. I was talking about exercise at the time. Uh, what's brought me back is um, my interest and passion for basketball. It turns out that uh, you have a couple of um, uh, people here that uh, play and invited me to play. And uh, after they schooled me a couple times, uh, one of them tried to be polite to me and said how, gave me compliments about my shoes, which um, <laughs> were, were your classic uh, Chuck Taylor black and white um, Converse tennis shoes, and I made the comment to them, well, that's all we had when I was playing uh, high school basketball. We didn't have all these fancy uh, different Nikes and uh, all the other ones. And so I promised them that I would show them a picture of what we had and what we looked like when uh, I played uh, high school. So in front of everybody, um, this, <laughs> this is my high school senior year basketball team, and you see you're laughing. You notice that um, we all have the same black and white Converse tennis shoes. That's all we had. Uh, this is, that was one of the other comments. Oh, uh, so your, your picture is only in black and white. So it is in black and white. Yeah, we didn't have color then. And um, those are bright red jerseys. And that's when shorts were really short. <laughs> Okay, not these big baggy things that they have today. And in case you haven't recognized yet, there's your speaker. Okay, now the important thing about playing basketball with these uh, TLU basketball players is that they've got me back in playing shape so that now I can uh, compete and play well with my friends in San Antonio as shown in this. <laughs> All right, so um, Dr. Grove has challenged me to give you some experiences. Um, you might notice if you did read the announcement, it said 40 years. Well, I just realized that it's already stretched to 45 years. And so imagine you're going to go through a tour of 45 years in 45 minutes or so. Um, so we're going to speed through this pretty quickly. But my, my challenge is to give you some insights as to all or many other possibilities that perhaps you've never heard about with a background in biological sciences. Okay, so this started in my undergraduate uh, at San Jose State, now university, but it also was college at the time I, I uh, attended. And it starts not with the institution in my view, but just like you have here, excellent uh, mentorship with the teachers that you have. It started with me, with my uh, head advisor, Dr. Jim Bosco. Um, I don't know that I've ever met a man who had passion for learning and teaching like this individual had. Um, Dr. Bosco is um, now passed. Um, he was an international gold medalist champion in badminton. Unbelievable, uh, unbelievable uh, athlete, also a gymnast in college. Uh, and he actually passed away winning his, while he was winning his third match at uh, a tournament in North Carolina. And so the, he uh, got the gold medal uh, posthumously. Um, he set the stage 
for, when I walked out of his class the very first day, my response was, I want to be that guy. And that's what you want to look for in a mentor. He also was interested in learning and therefore research, and so he collaborated with a scientist down the road about 10 miles from San Jose State, Dr. John Greenlee from uh, NASA's Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. And Dr. Greenleaf sort of took me under his wing and supported me through my dissertation research. So I volunteered to be a subject. So this is your speaker again. <laughs> so chops and mustaches were in, as were, uh, you'll see in a couple slides, uh, so were uh, afros in the 70s. And I had enough hair to do it. <laughs> okay. And this is actually my first uh, job as a human research volunteer in which um, I, we helped develop the liquid cooling garment that actually is worn by astronauts under their EVA suits. So when they go out on their spacewalks, they keep cool by having these suits. Uh, it looks like long underwear. You can see right here the tubing that fed water, and so as the individual heats up, it, there are sensors to feed back and say this individual now has a body temperature of X, and it cools, it brings cool water in, it keeps it cool. Okay. If you go to Johnson Space Center and have, have, ever have a tour uh, of the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, um, you'll see up on the wall a mannequin, and the mannequin has the uh, suit on it. So, environmental biology, and being, having opportunities that, that do exist for actual problem solving uh, in, the, um, uh, in different environments. I also was a test subject over the next couple of years uh, on the study of the cardiovascular system and how it responds to what we call orthostatic challenge. This is an orthostatic challenge, standing up straight. Okay. Blood tends to pool into the lower extremities, away from the heart and the head. And the body has mechanisms to get that enough oxygen back to the brain. And that's what keeps people orthostatic. And people don't know necessarily that 40 to 50% of astronauts have fainting problems when they come back from space flight. Okay? So we wanted to understand what those mechanisms were. And I had the opportunity to participate in those experiments. Again, knowing biology, and particularly in this case, cardiovascular Biology. Oh, by the way, I was totally a, I was a paid volunteer in those days. We were paid one dollar and eighty-five cents an hour. Okay. I then went to the University of California, Davis. I was recruited there by Dr. Ed Bernauer, uh, an exercise and environmental physiologist, and Dr. Bernauer also collaborated with Dr. Greenleaf and Dr. Bosco. So there was this networking. And that's very important, too, when you're looking for mentorship. How much does your mentor know the individuals in the field? Okay. My wife, Barbara, encouraged me to mention Dr. Ray Berger, who saved my career. Dr. Berger was the chair of my orals exam committee, and I failed my first exam. Now, they could have just washed me out of the program Dr. Berger took me every Monday and Wednesday morning for six months from 7 to 8 o'clock on his own time. And he quizzed me and worked with me to develop my thinking process. And my second time through, I just blew through and, and uh, uh, easily passed. Um, you, this is what you have to become successful in our field is you've got good mentors. Okay, now Dr. Bernauer came from the Big Ten. Illinois, and the Big Ten is really big in wrestling. Wrestling has sort of gone away at college level now, but uh, in his day, there was, uh, it was big, particularly at Iowa. And so he was interested in conducting a study where we studied individuals, wrestlers, who had to lose weight and restrict their fluid to make their weights. Okay. Anybody familiar with these types of regimens? They are nasty. Mixed martial arts. People are doing that now. Okay. They have to make their weight, so they go through these. This particular picture, there I am again, I've grown that out a little bit more. <laughs> and what we're doing here is actually measuring, I learned to measure by dilution technique blood volume. And so my scientific theme, underlying theme of this talk, 
is blood volume. And what is blood volume? What is its relationship biologically with regard to how we function? So we measure blood volume, and then we had our subjects, our wrestlers, exercise for three minutes because that was the time for a particular period in wrestling, and go all out, arms and legs together as hard as they could for three minutes. Okay, and that was their performance, and that's pretty much how they wrestle. Okay, so what was the purpose? I tried to put any of the data slides, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Their average loss of weight was almost four and a half percent of their body weight. That's a pretty good loss of, of weight in three days. Okay. So here's what baseline looked like. Blood volume, they, on average, there were eight wrestlers, they had an average blood volume of about 5.7 liters. Okay, that's pretty, five to six is pretty average. Okay. And the amount of oxygen that they were maximally able to utilize to do the, those arms and legs uh, maximal effort was on the order of about 2.2 to 2.3 liters per minute. Okay? The numbers are important. The changes are important. So after only three days of restricting their both fluids and uh, nutritional intake, Blood volume is decreased by over 650 ml. How much, does somebody know how much you get when you go to blood donation? 450. So this is like giving one and a half units of blood and then trying to go out and wrestle with it. Okay? But what was interesting is that it was perfectly correlated with a drop in their ability to utilize oxygen and therefore perform. So they're hurting their performance by decreasing their blood volume so much in such a short period of time. Now, three days after that, after their weigh-in, all of this was simulated, we had them go back and eat and drink as much as they want to gain back, and they came up, but they didn't recover, so three days was not even enough. So imagine a wrestler who has multiple matches over periods of time where this now is accumulating, and you can get into quite a deficit of, of performance. But here's a relationship that I want you to keep in your mind. If you plot that change in blood volume, decreasing going to the left, and the decrease in the amount of blood that's going out of the heart with each stroke, the stroke volume, there's a strong positive relationship. This individual here was the one uh, wrestler who didn't need to lose weight. He was already at his weight. So you can see that makes sense. He had no change in anything, okay? But as these other wrestlers lost, the more blood volume that they lost, the more restriction they did, the greater the reduction in the ability of the heart to get blood and therefore oxygen to the working tissue. And that was the relationship between basically the reduction in the utilization of, of oxygen and performance. Very basic concept. I point that out now because you're going to see it consistently. We found this to be reaffirmed. So this got me pointed in the direction of doing doctoral dissertation research. And so I was interested in what's this relationship between blood volume and performance. And these are data, we should always remember our past and our history. These are data from 19, post 1949. And it shows the comparison of individuals who are not active and those that are, and you always see that there is a higher blood volume in those that are more trained and perform better. And these are world-class athletes. This came from the, the Carroll Institute, Institute, these data. Scandinavia, what are they famous for? Cross-country skiing. Cross-country skiing, you bet. And they have some of the highest oxygen uptakes and blood volumes in the world. Okay, so you can see this relationship. So I was interested in asking this question. What is it that causes blood volume to increase with activity? Okay, is it the activity itself, the meta increased metabolism that the body adapts to? Or is it simply because we raise the body's temperature and it becomes something that is an adaptation for sweat and dissipating heat? Okay, so, this is your speaker again, being a subject for himself. And by the way, this was the philosophy that Dr. Greenleaf taught me and others. 
and that is you never ask a human subject to do anything that you're not willing to do yourself. So I was always a subject for my own experiments. And that's part of the learning process in terms of really understanding biology. It's how you feel about it when you're going through something. Okay? So being at Ames Research Center, I had access to an environmental chamber where we could exercise individuals under a controlled environment and also heat them up without exercise. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, apparatus that we had to work with, taking, measuring oxygen consumption and collecting uh, blood samples here. And you can see me looking away. I can tell you that I hate blood samples. <laughs> and it, the, these types of experiments, we didn't have in those days the capability of putting a line in and leaving it there and just drawing blood. We had a separate stick for every blood sample that uh, had to be taken. Okay, so here's what we did. We wanted to test how much of the increase in plasma or the water portion of your blood volume is caused by the increase in heat during exercise and how much of it is actually due to the exercise. And so the way we designed this is we had two groups. One was called the heat group without exercise, the other one the exercise group, and we increased their body temperature to 38.2, but we mashed them. Okay. Pretty cool design, actually. All right. So they both had the same thermal stress. Now, the challenge is, is how do you get the heat up when you just have someone sitting there? It's hard. We have great thermal regulatory systems, another good fundamental biological uh, concept. So this is about 104 degrees. Fahrenheit. These individuals are at 75. The exercise you don't have to do much because they're going to produce heat because they're exercising, right? But even putting them in 104 degrees, they keep their body temperature pretty good, pretty normal. So you have to block all avenues of heat loss. And the way you do that is you crank up the humidity. And these individuals, this was miserable. These individuals had no way to dissipate heat, and so the the body temperature increased, and we increased it to the same level of exercise, okay? And we did this for eight days in a row for two hours on those eight days. I can tell you that every one of my subjects in the heat hated me by the end of this. <laughs> okay? So what was the answer? Well, sure enough, the plasma volume increased and these guys just sitting, they didn't do any exercise by about 5%. Okay. Now, what's our hypothesis? If exercise, we only got a 5% increase in plasma volume, then it's heat that's the primary stimulus for the increase in plasma volume. Okay. But if it's more, then there's also a metabolic effect. Okay. That's about 12%. So we concluded from this about 40% of the increase in plasma volume is caused by a heat stimulus and the other 60% by a metabolic stimulus. Okay? Well, we weren't done there. We thought, now let's go to the next step and let's take a group and lower the exercise part but keep the thermal part the same with the same duration and the same frequency. And who's willing to take a guess on the hypothesis what the number's going to be there? Come on. This is hypothesizing, you can't be wrong. Maybe the sum of the two. The sum of the two. Golly, I would wish you had been wrong now, and then I could have told you you're wrong, but you're right. Okay. So the two. You want to come work with me because we need to do So not only do they both contribute, but they're, they're independent stimuli for the increase in blood volume. That's what we learned from this, okay? Now, I also, because I was working there in the Bay Area, Mountain View is what, where Ames Research Center was, I worked at, in the uh, Department of Cardiology at Stanford University. And this is simply the, the uh, uh, top of one of our publications, and that's not important. What's important, again, is individuals and how they can influence you, okay? One of the co-authors on this paper is N. Shumway, Dr. Norman Shumway. Who can tell me who Norman Shumway is? 
None of you can, and I'm not surprised. And that will be one of your take-home lessons. Okay. Because we don't remember names necessarily, but we remember impacts. Right? This is the man who, who executed the very first successful cardiac transplant in this country and is known as the grandfather for transplants. Pretty awesome to think back that I shook the hand that held the first heart that was successfully transplanted into a human being. And so we were able to do studies to study the impact of denervation of nerves to the heart and without denervation because we had a model of cardiac transplant patients that didn't have innervation. That's pretty cool. Okay. Take home lesson is not only did we have great mentorship, but we had great opportunities. You got to recognize where your opportunities are and jump on them. Okay, so we learned a lot of fundamental biology about the control of the heart through the nervous system by using this type of a model. Okay. Then I, there was an announcement for an assistant professor position at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, I was mentioning before the talk to a couple people, this was the chair at the time, Dr. Jack Wilmore. Dr. Jack Wilmore is renowned for starting the first adult fitness program in the university system where elderly people from the community came to the university and they did makeups of these individuals with how fit they were, what their blood profiles were, and um, he started all of that at the University of Arizona. But why was he interested in me? Because we had an elderly group who was exposed to extreme heat and we wanted to know how well with the work that we had done on the biology of blood volume could we help improve the performance and the health of these elderly people. Okay, pretty cool. So during that time, I continued to make measurements of blood volume and maximal oxygen uptake, maximal capability of using oxygen. We have the biggest database known and that's what it looks like. It's that same, it's that same blood profile I showed you before. This is a fundamental biological relationship. Okay? How important blood volume is to being able to utilize oxygen in the tissue to perform exercise, to perform physical work. Okay? Now, what's neat about this is that it's not just applied to humans. If this is really a, a fundamental principle of biology, it, it should go across different species, right? So these are the data that we published that I just presented to you. And I had a graduate student who was working in the animal uh, physiology department. And he was interested, he was actually working with horses. And he took my exercise physiology course and he said, I'm interested in doing this work, but now in animals. And he wanted to do it in a horse. So he set up his first experiment, a preliminary experiment, in dogs. It's published in the American Journal of Physiology and showed that dogs also increase their blood volume. And that allowed him to set up his experiment. And he showed that horses do this. And then we went to the literature. And Dr. Charlie Tipton, who also came to Arizona a year after I went to Arizona, showed it in rats. This is a general physiological or biological principle. The relationship between increasing blood volume and increasing the capability of utilizing oxygen at the tissue level across all species. Okay. Well, I was torn away from academia. I love teaching. But this was an exciting job announcement when NASA at the Kennedy Space Center wanted an exercise physiologist to help them, and I, I should say an exercise biologist, to help them with their exercise countermeasure program for astronauts. Okay. By the way, this picture is of the vehicular assembly building. Uh, that's 526 feet up in the air on, on the roof. I've been there. Nice view of the Space Coast. Okay. This is where all the vehicles are put together for launch. Okay. And I'll just mention to you, there was nothing more exciting. I, I was able to see live 25 of these launches. And they never get old. When you're standing seven miles away, 
and you feel the earth shake below your feet because of the power of 40 million tons of thrust that comes off of that pad. It's pretty awesome. But while I was there, I was there to do research, right, and support their research program. And so how they wanted to know what's the impact of gravity on this relationship with blood volume and exercise performance because we want our astronauts to be performing as well as they possibly can. Right? So one way to test gravity impacts is to fly in the aircraft, the uh, KC-135 aircraft, that climbs to about 36,000 feet and goes over the top and dives 24,000 feet in 30 seconds. You think you've been on a roller coaster ride. <laughs> no way. And here's your speaker again, floating in weightlessness and free fall. Because that's what you get. You get that and you're able to do various measurements in real time as you're floating in free fall for about 25 to 30 seconds. But we we have these profiles where we did 20 in a row. Okay, and after you got done, feeling nauseous with that, they did another 20 in a row. Dr. Squire said you did how many when you did it? Well, on my first mission, we were supposed to do 150, but we only did 100. That's because Dr. Squire is a violent leader. I will point out here, that little, back in counter. <laughs> that little slip right there, you see me smiling. This was my second flight because I had enough uh, 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 dopamine and, and dexedrine on board. Uh, so that I, I got over my nausea. The first day I had filled one of these bags easily. That actually, that little slip there is my bag. We kept the uh, pocket open so that it was easily available quickly. The vomit comet. It is known as the vomit comet. Okay. Got a chance to play astronaut. So again, the thermal load, the, the um, training that I had in um, thermal regulation. They used to put us in the landing ensemble uh, with the helmet on, and then we actually had uh, recovery uh, missions where the paramedics would have to come out and find us in the middle in a swamp in the middle of um, Kennedy Space Center, uh, and then rescue us and bring us back on the helicopter. Uh, again, it was an issue of how long can we sit out there before we're going to be know. Okay, and then I had a chance to meet. This is in later years, obviously, a lot of astronauts and interact with astronauts. And to get feedback on the biology of space flight and what they felt. This is Dr. Joe Kerwin. Ask the question again. Who knows Joe Kerwin? I do. You do. <laughs> I told you you shouldn't have <laughs> There's Dr. Joe performing physical examination in the first skydive flight in 1973. Okay, imagine doing that with someone upside down and trying to figure out how well or, or um, not they are during space flight. So our challenge was how do, we, how do we study this biology on the ground and we actually use a bed rest model with the head tilted downward about six degrees and what this causes is fluid shifts just like we see in the astronauts during space flight so we can do experiments for longer periods of time on the ground, okay? Here's fundamental observation. The fundamental biology of this adaptation is, here's percent change of, again, the maximal oxygen uptake, the blood volume, and its components, plasma volume and red blood cell volume, okay? What do you expect the change is gonna be? Negative, right? Pretty proportionate, all around five or six percent, just what we learned in the previous slides, right? But what's key here is these are individuals who are relatively sedentary. They're unfit. What are astronauts? They're generally pretty fit. So when we compare these responses to fit individuals, you get a two to three fold greater reduction in the work capability. Dr. John, Green, uh, John Greenleaf called this the concept of the bigger you are, the farther you fall. Okay? 
So this was important because now we had to manage the exercise program for the astronauts during spaceflight with much higher intensity of exercise in order to minimize those changes and keep their full function. Okay, so again, knowing that relationship, and is this familiar? Volume, maximal oxygenation, same relationship. There's the unfit, and there's the fit, and look at this. It comes back to that same fundamental biological relationship. Okay? Well, there's another problem that we had to try to counter with space flight. It's called orthostatic intolerance. The astronauts come back and they're asked to stand, and guess what? They have less blood volume circulating. So now when they have pooling of blood, uh, po pooling of blood in the lower extremities, there's less blood there in the first place, and so they become faint. Okay. So how do we manage that? Well, I had the opportunity, again, an opportunity to work with a collaborator. This is Dr. Joan Vernikos. She was the NASA Director of Life Sciences at NASA's headquarters uh, in Washington. Okay. Incredible woman, incredible scientist who was interested in working with me based on my training in biology and these relationships to figure out an easy solution or an easier solution for astronauts to help this problem of orthostatic intolerance. Dr. Joan has written two books. I would recommend you read these, where she used her experience with gravity and the lack of gravity and sitting around and how it can deteriorate individuals, particularly in aging. And she is now retired from NASA, but she goes internationally to talk to elderly groups because of her training in biology and what she has learned in her research with low gravity and high gravity. And the bottom line is, is this, she, she lectures to them about the fact that they need to keep active in, in aging or you become sedentary and more sick. She happens to be in this picture with um, John Glenn, Senator John Glenn. Now, how many of you have heard of John Glenn? There's a few of you, all right. So John Glenn, was the first astronaut to fly an orbital mission around the Earth, second astronaut in space. Okay. But what's key here, and where Joan really got interested in, she was the uh, life science director when he flew his second time. So he flew his first time in 1962 at the age of 41. And they were able to, as a US senator, to get him to fly again in 1998, 36 years later and able to study, this is the first and only astronaut that we have, that we've actually been able to get some data on the effects of aging and how that impacts blood volume and uh, exercise performance. Okay. So, real quick, this is a seminar all in itself, but real quick summary. We've studied, we got together with Joan, and we studied during bed rest the simulation of space flight the cardiovascular system, the biology of the cardiovascular system. We studied the control of blood pressure from nerve endings in the carotid arteries. So we had special chambers for that. Again, there I am volunteering first before I do that to a human subject. Okay. Other types of pressure receptors and barrel reflexes. We looked at pooling of blood in the lower extremities. All of these things deteriorate or increase the uh, possibility of orthostatic intolerance from space flight. Okay? And then we actually did exercise tests, post-flight, pre-flight, and post-flight at the Kennedy Space Center on astronauts when they came back because they landed there. That was a lot of fun, too. And then we did stand tests on them. Okay. All of this helped us to understand what is the biology and the effects on biological systems of gravity and the removal of gravity. Okay. And here's a real quick summary that we found. So guess what? Again, I showed you this earlier. Blood volume decreases. Okay. Decreases blood coming back to the heart and filling it, so the output of the heart is reduced. Everything we talked about, no different. The ability to constrict your vessels decreases, and so we can't even 
keep the blood pressure up, and the blood pressure is the pressure that keeps blood going to the brain, and that's why individuals become dizzy and want to static, and they faint. And not only that, we just showed you that the decrease in blood volume decreases the maximal capability of using oxygen. All of, all of what we've observed previously, but here was the key that, of the research that we did with Dr. Vernikos, and that is we showed that if an astronaut can, can perform only one bout of maximal exercise at the end of their mission, within 24 hours of coming back from space flight, we reverse all of this. Cool. Now that doesn't mean that you all should only, you know, lay around for two weeks and then just wait. <laughs> but it shows how how much plasticity is in the biology of controlling volume as it relates to blood pressure control and utilization of oxygen. We really have an incredible dynamic in adapting biology. And then I had other jobs at Kennedy Space Center. This was a lot of fun. This is your speaker here behind the mask. We tested different protective ensembles. So imagine being on the fire department at Kennedy Space Center and having to get into a non-permeable suit and go out in the heat and humidity of Florida and work under these conditions carrying big amounts of hypergolic fuels, which are the fuels uh, that are used by the space shuttle when it was being launched. They're poisonous. And so the individuals heated up, and we had problems with individuals staying under those conditions. So we began to test these in the laboratory to model what we needed to do, how much time they would have so that we, we could get a replacement in there before they got into physiological stress. Okay? That was fun. And who was I talking about with the, with regard to plants, right? This is, so at the Kennedy Space Center, what they were also planning for, and continue to plan for, is sending plants, growing things into space, particularly if they're gonna to go to Mars. And so the controlled ecological life support system, or cells, actually grows plants without dirt. You can't bring dirt with you to Mars or anywhere else, okay? And then what we did, because of my training in exercise biology, is we did the very first experiment to show the interaction between the human and plants. The human helps the plants, why? Because when we take up oxygen, we produce CO2, and plants take up CO2 and produce oxygen, and we were able to describe for the first time quantifiably that interaction. That's pretty cool. We, we, uh, uh, we published that in Act Astronautica. Okay? All right. Well, we're moving along here now on this 45-year uh, uh, journey. And now I come to San Antonio in 1993 to work for the Air Force. And the Air Force had a whole new problem. Dr. Squires and I and others were talking at lunch about the fact that there was an observation that individuals who are highly trained aerobically, runners, seem to have a lower tolerance or the static tolerance. They seem to faint more than those individuals who are sedentary. All right, now think about that, because that's sort of opposite of what I've been telling you with this relationship between blood volume and performance, right? What's that about? So we had the challenge to come in and see if we could see what was going on. And this was so serious to the Air Force that their Air Combat Command made a recommendation that we're going to limit the amount of aerobic training of running that we want our, our pilots to do. And boy, were the pilots unhappy. Because they knew anecdotally that they, they felt better when they, when they did a lot of exercise. So what's going on? They, boy, I get visits and knocks on my door all the time asking me to do something about this because they didn't want, they didn't agree with this recommendation. So, we studied this problem with Dr. Peter Raven and, and others, and we finally figured out that there's an inverse U shape on this relationship in aerobic capacity and orthostatic performance. So that you get a benefit with exercise, 
up to a particular point, and then once you get over about 60 milliliters, uh, uh, milliliters per minute kg of aerobic capacity, now we start to decrease again because there are other adaptations that overwhelm just the blood volume part. Okay. So that's pretty cool because now we went back to Air Combat Command and say, just make sure your pilots aren't over 60. Easy solution. And sure enough, if you look at astronauts and pilots, they're in the mid to high 40s. They aren't even near it. So no problem. They changed their, their uh, recommendation. So that's when you know you have an impact by understanding what the biology of the adaptation is. Okay. All right, now, for those of you who are squeamish about seeing nasty blood, look down or look away, because this is the only uh, slide I have in here, but I have it in here to emphasize how serious now I have moved to the US Army Institute of Surgical Research, and our primary mission is saving lives on the battlefield from severe trauma. That's what we have to deal with. Okay, and these individuals will bleed out quickly. The problem is getting them, keeping them alive until we can get them to a higher echelon of care, uh, a, a combat support hospital. If we can get them to the hospital alive, they have a 96 to 98 percent chance of living. Problem is, 90 percent of them die in the pre-hospital. So that's where we we need to make a change. Okay. Well, one way of doing this is to resuscitate. Help them get some of the fluid back, or at least the effects, the biology of the fluid, right? And so we've worked with an inventor of a therapy called intrathoracic pressure regulation. Now, what is that? Well, why did we even go here? Not all the combat medics, they, they can't carry around the weight of fluids. So they don't have fluids a lot of the time, or they're minimal to use. And in the example I gave you of that casualty, that ain't going to work. And so we thought, can we do something that gives a resuscitation effect without having fluid? Okay. And it turns out that every time we breathe in, this is very important for exercise and in anything that we do, every time we breathe in, in order to fill the lungs and get air in, what do we have to do? We have to decrease the pressure inside of the thorax, inside of your ribcage, right? I just, I just dropped it, okay? That's how I filled my lungs with air, okay? So that profile would look like this. Well, if you develop a way to get a little resistance that you breathe in, you can do this right now. Put your finger in your mouth and try to breathe, and you can feel that added vacuum. And that vacuum effect, this here, literally sucks blood back to the heart. It's like a resuscitation without having any fluids. Okay? And that in turn fills the heart and allows more blood to go out of the heart and increase pressure. If you didn't know this, this is a very important mechanism for exercise. What do we do at the end of exercise? Do this and, and every time that's helping to recover because we're bringing blood back to the heart. But just as important, this is really awesome. That decreased pressure in the chest cavity is being translated to the brain and it's decreasing intracranial pressure. And that intracranial pressure represents the resistance to forward flow. So you're reducing the resistance to flow. You've got more flow coming at you. You've increased flow to the brain. And people, including astronauts, as well as combat casualties, now will not faint or go into shock, okay? So we get, we get increased blood flow to all the vital organs without even having to put any fluids in. Is that cool? All right, problem solving. Looking at it, what do I know about biology? What can we do to translate it, okay? All right. I want you to know that this is really translatable. Here's the systolic blood pressure before this therapy is given to individuals who have had severe trauma in pre-hospital and have had severe hemorrhage due to that trauma, okay? 80 over about 45 blood pressure. What's normal? You guys should know this. 
120 over 80, right? This is, this is by definition shock. And the difference between the two is about 25 to 30. That, we, that is associated with how much stroke volume, how much blood is being pumped out of the heart, okay? We put this therapy on, and it pumps it right up to 110 over 65, almost normal blood pressure, and increases the stroke volume indicator of pulse pressure without any fluids. This is being used right now in San Antonio by San Antonio Fire Department paramedics. Our research has had an impact. Okay. But more importantly, throughout the country, we have clinical trials going on right now comparing standard CPR. Okay. And you ought to relate to this. How many have had CPR? Okay, that's a whole other seminar, by the way, <laughs> as to how we've impacted the field of CPR. And we've compared that to adding the resistance, the IPR therapy. Why? Because when you compress, you don't get a very good expulsion of blood out into the, because no blood is coming back. This helps suck that blood back, so now every time you compress, you get more blood out. And here are the results, preliminary results, with just the standard CPR. We have a survival neurological outcome, a good neurological outcome of about 6%. We increase that by over 50% when we use this type of technology. That's the biggest jump in improving out of hospital survival in, in cardiac arrest that has been done ever. Okay. Knowing the biological impacts, knowing your biology helps to solve real life problems. Okay. On August 4, 2005, I received this email along with a couple of other my colleagues out of Iraq, out of the Combat uh, Support Hospital in Iraq. Uh, just a quick note about a save today. Soldier with gunshot wound, two pelvis, came in with shot with an intra-arterial blood pressure of, what we say, 120 over 80 is normal? How about 36 over 16? Hematocrit is normally, this is your ratio of red blood cells to total blood is usually around 40%. Hematocrit of 8 and a base deficit of 26, usually that's in the 6 to 10 range. Those numbers, the individual is usually dead. They won't even try to divide them. Had trouble with the central venous line access, so no blood or intravenous uh, fluids for 13 minutes. So gave epinephrine. Uh, Vasopressin, atropine, these are all standard drugs uh, that are recommended by the American Heart Association and still no change. They're losing this casualty. Placed IPR therapy and got a palpable pressure, 70 plus now, for the intra-arterial pressure. That finally got lined, 16 units of blood and damage control surgery, now off the OR table in stabilized condition. Again, thanks for your support. I can tell you that there is no greater gratification when you are able to be part of a life-saving event like this because of the research that you've been able to translate from the laboratory to actual application. Okay. How am I doing? We're just about done, right? Now. Okay. You sure? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll go through this real quick. We'll go through this real quick, but it, it gets us to the point where we want. So now combat casualty care, that's one thing, the resuscitation. The other thing is to identify early on that someone's in trouble, going, going to be going into shock. These are the data, two groups of trauma patients who had severe hemorrhage, okay? Open and red bars. Look at the blood pressures, 120 over 70, normal. Okay, no one's going to get excited about this. These are the normal uh, vital signs that are normally taken. Uh, the oxygen carrying the blood is near 100%. That's normal. Heart rate is a little elevated, but they just underwent severe uh, hemorrhage and, and injury, so that's, it's in the high 80s. Okay. That's what's striking. The group in the red went on to die within six hours. We didn't know it because the paramedics are given technology that tells us nothing early on about 
what's really happening. Okay, so our current technologies aren't sensitive or specific enough. We need to do better. So part of our research, knowing biological relationships, is that we thought, well, let's get away from the bias of always measuring blood pressure and heart rate and SpO2. Let's measure something that might represent the changing amount of compensation that's going on for all these changes. Okay? So we thought, why don't we measure and look at the features of waveforms? Okay? Now, most of you haven't studied all your biology yet, so you wouldn't know this. But there's a normal waveform. It looks like it just has a little notch here. That is actually made up of two events. The first one is the uh, heart contracting and pushing blood out into the arterial tree. And that pressure wave goes all the way out and it reflects back. So there's a reflective wave in there. And so if we know what these feature changes are in someone who's hemorrhaging, and that's what a hemorrhaged person looks like. It tells us everything we know, need to know about the compensation. You can see that now the separation, the height, and the width is different. All that information is important, okay? And so we can do that in a model that we have called lower body negative pressure. We can simulate hemorrhage. And oh, oh by the way, seriously, if you want to see me after the talk, we do have a sign-up sheet. We're looking for patients, subjects to go through this event where we can decrease the pressure systematically and progressively in the chamber. It takes its negative pressure, so it takes blood and redistributes it away from the heart and the head, and the physiology looks just like hemorrhage. So we can study this. And when we do that, this is what it looks like. This is an actual subject that we had who's undergoing one of these hemorrhages, and this Bar, almost like a fuel tank, is changing in the feature, showing us how much compensation is being used. And so if you watch the clock here at about seven and a half minutes, this individual will go, the color will be turned yellow, which means they've used 40% of their ability to compensate. And yet, look at your vital signs. This is what right now paramedics are looking at. So they're not getting excited. Okay? And at about 13 minutes, you'll see this get into the red. So this individual is using their ability to compensate, and it's working quite well because these, these are being compensated for. They're staying constant. Is that cool? And we'll get right about to, only now at about 18 minutes, you get a heart rate that's in around 90. So you might have some indication that something wrong is going on, but heart rate's not very good. And right about 22 minutes, you're going to see the crash. Okay? So right about here, 118, 19, 111, 105, 69, 145, SpO2 went from 95 or 96 to 97. This person basically went into shock. Okay? We knew that was headed that way at seven and a half minutes. Look how much time we would buy the paramedics or our combat medics if we had this type of technology. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through these. I'm not gonna spend any more time with this because we need to we need to finish up. This is all the places now that we have this technology working. We actually have it on uh, mothers during childbirth. Um, we have it on blood donations so that we can predict whether or not someone's going to stand up and faint. And most importantly, it is being used on the battlefield by IDF as the Israeli Defense Forces. Okay? So I will finish with um, one of my most favorite quotes. It's not always about knowledge, but it's what you use it for. Right? It's, it's what you can imagine. All right? So let's imagine now that this is not just theory that we're talking about. But we actually have one of these, and I welcome any and all of you to come down and see what your reserve to compensate is. We can get it in real time, particularly the basketball players, because today I'm going to run this into the red. <laughs> and I'm going to go through that. And here's your take-home message. Not very many of them are scientific. 
This is more important. Okay? It's important that we learn from your training in biological sciences to take knowledge and translate it to where we can make an impact. Okay? This one is the only message I've found today. Okay? Blood is good for you. Keep it. You want to keep it. Okay? We're here to solve problems. You need to be able to take your knowledge and recognize where the problems are and how to solve it. Okay, which I've given you a number of examples. Give you a number of examples here. We may not remember the names, but we know the impacts. And that's what we want to strive for. We're not here for glory, we're here to make a difference. I will assure you that in my mind and in my heart, I was sitting in your seat just yesterday. Okay, you will not believe how quickly you get to my point in life. And so time is precious. You want to use it the best you can to make that impact and to translate. And finally, I will guarantee you that if you choose a career path that you are passionate about, you will not work a day in your life. It's a lot of fun. I thank you for sharing your time this afternoon with me. I hope I've shed some new light into how you can go out with your biological sciences training and change the world. Thanks. Technology is about is learning the individual and what your state is. So you might have a greater reduction in your blood volume because you're working out on the field, it's hot, and you've lost uh, maybe 300 ml of your plasma and blood volume. Okay? The guy next to you may have only lost 150, but he doesn't have as good a uh, capability of compensating for that loss. And so that's the person that's in greater risk of going into uh, fame or uh, incapacitation. And so we need a way to assess it, and then we need a way to address it. And the way to address it could be fluid uh, intake or actually using, and I didn't bring this out, this is a, it's that simple. So I need is to breathe against resistance, and that helps with the resuscitation. All right. Yes. Um, earlier you talked about, very briefly, uh, plants and NASA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess my question is, um, you said, how would they like, make the plants if they you can't bring soil? So this is hydroponic technology okay. where you all, so um, I learned this by working at NASA. Um, we have this, um, I think it's a perception that you need dirt, that there's something magical in the dirt. The only thing magical in the dirt is the nutrition, and the nutrition could be in the foods. Okay. Um, how many of you have been to Epcot Center in Florida? Okay. There is, you probably didn't know to look for it necessarily, but there is a display there from NASA, from a cells project, and they, are, they basically demonstrate uh, these plants, um, vegetables being grown without dirt. Don't need it. The dirt has nothing more than the, so just bring the, the, the nutrients along. So they have fish? Oh, you know what? That's a good, do they have fish was the comment. It turns out that they use tilapia to, um, in this uh, cells project, and that would be the fish to, to, uh, uh, to provide nutrition also. Yeah, they're doing a lot of cool stuff. 
I'd just like to mention that Dr. Convertino went to graduate school in physiology with Dr. Deborah Hedger, and that they were friends for many, many years. Many of y'all don't remember Dr. Hedger, but she passed away recently. But she founded the molecular biology part of, of our department, and uh, Dr. Convertino has been a long time friend of Texas Lutheran University. And he takes students for internships and, uh, and funds them. And I'd like to say that we just got a 30,000 uh, grant from the Bud Wine uh, Foundation in honor of Dr. Earl Beard. Dr. Earl Beard was my professor. He was John Glenn's doctor, who we mentioned here. And so he puts money in every year for you guys to do things, to do research, to do internships, to work with our professors here. But uh, Dr. Tom Kino, let's, let's thank him for his, his talk. Oh, yes. <laughs> So this, this job we're actually going to use, uh, and we're going to use Kristen to do, so we can do this at any time. We do need subjects, seriously, and uh, for doing the lower body negative pressure, we paid four hundred dollars. Yeah, I see you know, I said I stood there and I talked for an hour, and I didn't get any response like that. <laughs> For more information, please visit tlu.edu.